Stanford University. Welcome to E380, Spring 2011-2012. I'm Andy Freeman. The other course organizer is Dennis Allison. Ordinarily, I don't mention future talks. However, next week's talk is special. It will not be, avail it will not be available afterwards to people who are not enrolled in the class. Um, if you're not an enrolled student, you can only see it live or via live streaming. Uh, it will not be available on iTunes or any of the other archival sources. And this also applies to the slides. No slides, so video capture, I guess it is. Um, and I didn't say that. Um, before the term big data came along, we were said to be living in an age of information. But that wasn't true. We, were, we merely had access to a lot more data. And that trend has only gotten worse and we're really just inundated by bits. It's not data. It's just meaningless bits flowing at us. We don't have a clue of understanding it, and nobody really cares if we do. While today's talk is nominally about medical statistics, it is really about turning data into understanding. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to do a mic check here. Um, so. Live from Palo Alto, it's Wednesday afternoon. Live from Stanford. Okay. Their own zip code. I stand corrected. Yeah. <laughs> I've just been waiting for a long time for that line. Just. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Dennis Allison for inviting uh, me to give this talk. And uh, this talk basically. Uh, is based on a paper that just appeared about uh, three months ago uh, that uh, myself and two other fellows uh, published in the UMAP journal. Uh, I think you can tell from the picture the two who still have day jobs. Uh, uh, it is an international collaboration. Uh, Leaf uh, is from Helsinki. And like a lot of other things, we met on the internet. So the three of us have never actually met face to face. We've exchanged a lot of email. Um, the other person I'd like to acknowledge, uh, if, he's, if he's watching or will be watching, is Paul Campbell of Beloit College. Paul is the editor of the UMAP Journal and uh, published our, our article when uh, many, many other people uh, were uh, less enthusiastic, shall we say. Um, Paul, Paul has published uh, some of our stuff in the past, and he's been a, a great supporter. So to get right into it, uh, medicine today is kind of an interesting paradox or dichotomy. Um, on the one hand, the uh, medical profession makes incredible use of high tech. If you look at this list of things, uh, not only didn't these things exist when I was a, a young man, we didn't even imagine that they could exist. Uh, the, the advances in, in, in medicine over the last 50 years, just unbelievable. And I, I can actually say that if it wasn't for modern medicine, uh, I wouldn't be standing here today. Um, so I have a, a real uh, visceral feeling for, for the progress. So that's the good news. Uh, the thing that is less encouraging have to do with a whole bunch of other issues that have nothing to do with technology. They have to do with what I would call medical decision making. And that is, how do uh, clinicians in the field make decisions about treating patients? And I'm not talking here about researchers. Uh, if you go to the journals, there's, there's tons of stuff in the medical journals that are really high quality science. But what I'm talking about here is what happens when it has to get down into the trenches. And there's a couple of indicators here that are not so encouraging. 
Um, in around 1990, there was a, uh, a movement that got started called evidence-based medicine. And I don't think uh, I need a lot of uh, explanation of what that's all about. Uh, and I've been watching that for about 20 years. And what I have to say is that uh, it's still struggling for acceptance as, as you move down to implementation. Uh, it's something that if you're a, a physicist or a mathematician or a scientist or an engineer, you look at it and you say, it's obvious. It's something we should be doing. Uh, doesn't seem to be taking the world by storm. Part of this, I think, has to do with the education of doctors. And that's something that is also very interesting to me because back in around 1975, I was responsible for teaching the required physics course for pre-meds at UC Irvine. And all I can say is that I don't think it was a very uplifting experience for the students, nor was it very uplifting for me. And part of it had to do with the fact that these to-be doctors had a very, very low level of understanding of even rudimentary mathematics. In fact, many of them weren't competent in arithmetic. Um, now, you know, it is what it is. But once again, I come back 35 years later, and I don't see a lot of progress. So that's a little distressing. The, the last one is the one that I'm really the most upset about, and that has to do with patient empowerment. Because we argue constantly that uh, the patient ought to be more involved in his own treatment plan, and he ought to understand what's going on. And once again, what we have is a huge gap. Uh, things that the doctors take for granted, but patients just don't have the vocabulary to deal with. And there doesn't seem to be uh, a way of communicating important information in a way that the patient can understand it. Uh, that's compounded by the fact that most doctors today just don't have the time uh, to, to sit down and explain things in detail. And if you layer on top of that the fact that most patients are having to deal with this information shortfall after they've just gotten some bad news and are in an emotional state, you can see that it's, it's not a very good situation. So throughout this talk, when, with, with, in relation to this last bullet, the thing I want to communicate right now is that the problem is really twofold. One, it's getting the answer and getting the best answer we can get for a given situation. And the second part of it is explaining it to the patient, having the patient understand what's going on. And in some, in some ways, that second problem is as important or more important than the first problem. So. Here's a road map of the talk. Uh, we're going to start out with medical diagnostics, move on to Bayes' theorem, and then move on to nomography. Three things, none of which are really that hard, but making the connection is, is what's interesting. So to start with medical diagnostics, the first thing is to get across the idea to everybody um, that it's all about probabilities. Uh, there's very little in the world of diagnostics that is a certain. Uh, it's all about trying to get the best possible estimate of what's going on. Um, and, you know, physicists sort of came to terms with this 85 years ago, the notion that quantum mechanics was probabilistic. Uh, we, we haven't quite... Uh, sort of gotten that into the mindset of people uh, with respect to everyday things. The next thing is we want a framework for updating our notions of probability. So you start out with a patient and with the suspicion that that patient might have a disease and you have an idea of the probability that that patient might have a disease and then you perform a test, a diagnostic test, 
and you get a result back, either positive or negative. And what you want to do is update your probability. So if the test comes back positive, you're going to raise the probability. If the test comes back negative, you're going to lower the probability. And what Bayes' theorem does is give you both a conceptual and a mathematical way of doing that updating. So it's basically um, an apparatus, if you will, uh, for knowing how to update your probability based on diagnostic results. Well, it turns out that there's a piece where nomography can be very helpful. The calculations or the computations are not difficult, frankly, but given the level of uh, just manipulative ability, uh, we find that it's much more interesting to have a graphical technique for doing this so that you can eliminate any algebraic manipulation or computation on the part of either the doctor or the patient. And what we'd like to do, ultimately, is reduce it to a graph. This is actually a nomogram, a very simple nomogram. Resembles a graph, and the way the nomogram works is you have your old probability, you have some scale here that represents something about the test, you draw a straight line through those two points, and you get your new probability over here. So what you want to do is reduce the problem to something that simple. So the rest of the talk is going to be filling in the details of how we go about doing this. And when we get to the nomography part, uh, we're going to have some hands-on, so you're going to actually use a nomogram. I made a very interesting discovery about two weeks ago. I was giving a version of this talk uh, in front of about 250 people in Atlanta. And there was the usual amount of buzz in the room. And as soon as I put up this slide, there was a hush. You could hear a pin drop. And I realized at that moment that the reason for that was that 98% of the audience possessed the prostate gland. And that this was something that all of a sudden got their attention. So before I play this video, I'd like to just say for the sole young woman in the audience, and for all the people out there in video land, that there is an analog here, of course, with mammography and breast cancer. Uh, the, the, the situation is a little different, the numbers are a little different, but it's, it's fundamentally the same problem. Uh, so, I'm going to now play this uh, video, and let's see how it goes. For a man over age 50 who has the most common type of PSA test, a result of four or less is generally considered normal, although some cases of prostate cancer occur in men with these normal PSA levels. Results above four are considered abnormal, but they don't always mean cancer is present. Abnormal levels above 10 are more likely to be caused by cancer, but still not always. Especially in that middle range, from about four to 10, elevated PSA levels are often caused by other conditions like prostate enlargement or inflammation. Out of 100 men who have PSA tests, about eight will have an abnormal result, a level over four. On average, only about three of these men will actually have cancer. The other five are false alarms that require more tests to prove there is no cancer. So the test isn't perfect. In fact, when we look at those who had normal results in our group of 100 men, about 15 actually turn out to have prostate cancer. Because the PSA test can miss prostate cancers, some doctors use a lower level as the cutoff between normal and abnormal. This catches more cancers, but it also creates more false alarms. I hope you all found that as reassuring as I did. That's <laughs> um, pretty stunning. Um, 
so as if you listen carefully to the narrator, he said the test, so the test isn't perfect, which I think kind of qualifies for the understatement of the day, if not the, the year. Uh, what I've done here is capture the data that was in that video in that two by two matrix where the green cells represent the healthy, the green cells represent the places where the test returned the right result. In other words, healthy people were diagnosed as healthy, people with cancer were diagnosed with cancer. The red cells are the places where the test got it wrong. And, you know, we have to agree the test isn't perfect. But the question is, well, how good is it or how bad is it? Uh, for example, uh, there's 15 false negatives out of 18. So it misses five out of six people who have cancer. And of the eight people that it says do have cancer, five of them don't. So those eight people are going to go out and have biopsies, and more than half of the biopsies are going to come back negative. So, you know, that kind of makes you feel a little uneasy about this test. Um, you could ask the question, well, do we have the wrong cutoff? Maybe the cutoff of four is not the right cutoff. But we can see that moving the cutoff either up or down is just going to trade off false negatives for false positive and vice versa. And we have to believe that four is the right cutoff because if there was a better cutoff, we'd be using that one. So uh, we can't look there to, to get any solace. Um, in fact, if we picked a different cutoff, we just have different numbers in the two by two matrix, but probably wouldn't be better. Yes, sir? Maybe you should be looking at the derivative as opposed to just some absolute value one test. Okay, the question was maybe we should be looking at the derivative and not just the numbers. And that opens up another whole can of worms about how the test should be used and could be used. And in fact, many doctors do look at the rate of change of PSA. Uh, but I'd like to keep it simple for right now. The PSA reading as it comes back is usually the first indicator. And the question is, should we be using this test to do routine screening, period? And to do that, we need to sort of characterize whether the test is good enough or not. The thing that really bothers me here is that if you look at that two by two matrix, you could say that the test has, is 80% accurate. Because in 80 cases out of 100, it gets the right answer. But not for me. Well, <laughs> think about the average man in the street who is going to read something about the test that's reported in the newspaper that says it's 80% accurate. How does he know? So, yeah, I mean, anything that you read in the popular press is going to have that kind of issue. So what we have here, or what we believe we have here, is a test characterization problem. It's not good enough to say the test isn't perfect. We have to put a number on it. And based on that, decide, you know, what to do. So back to square one. We can't really do a test characterization without understanding how the test is going to be used. Because a test is just one part of a diagnostic plan. It's one component. And unless we know what the protocol is, we don't know how to characterize the test. So let's think about what a reasonable diagnostic protocol would consist of. And I've listed about five things that I think are important. Number one being to keep the physician in the loop, because if you don't do that, you're never going to get anywhere. And it's probably a good idea to make use of all those years of medical school and, and practical experience. Uh, what I would like to see is a little more use of the scientific method. I would like to see something that could be defended on scientific grounds and these other ones. The candidate that we've come up with is Bayes' theorem. And there's nothing new about Bayes' theorem. Uh, 
It was actually enunciated before the United States of America even existed, um, around 1750, 1760. Most of the heavy lifting on Bayes' theorem was done by Laplace, who was a contemporary of Napoleon's. So, Bayes in a nutshell. Oh, by the way, that's the only illustration you'll ever see of the Reverend Bayes. It's the only one that exists. So whenever you see a picture of Bayes, that's the one you're going to see. Uh, historians now have established that that's not Bayes. <laughs> so the one picture we have, OK, is wrong. And, and, it, and it's a very curious thing how we know that that's not Bayes. It has to do with this collar that he's got. And apparently, that collar was not in fashion during the period of time that Bayes lived. So we know that this is a canard. As luck would have it, we have one picture, and it's, <laughs> it's not him. Um, so let's look at Bayes' theorem, which I believe really is another way of talking about the scientific method. Okay, And what do we do in the scientific method? We have an initial probability that the theory is valid. Okay, we perform an experiment, and the experiment result comes back. It either tends to confirm or refute the theory. And then there's a very important step, which is what I call the update step, where we take that initial probability and the test result, and based on our belief in the strength of that test, we update our probability. And that gets us a new probability. And in Bayesian language, there's the prior probability, there's the experimental test result, and then there's the posterior or post-test probability. And then that, that post-test probability becomes the initial probability for the next iteration, and you just iterate. Um, for those of us that spent a fair portion of our life debugging software, you'll recognize that this is also how most of us debug software, right? We have a theory about what's wrong with the code. We do a little experiment, and that tends to either confirm or uh, mitigate our belief in that cause. Then we update our theory, and we go on and do our next experiment. And I would say that, you know, I feel pretty good about the scientific method over the past few hundred years. I think it's enabled us to make a fair amount of progress. In fact, leading to a lot of that technology that was on the first slide. So how does this carry over to a diagnostic protocol? Well, it's a teensy bit different. Step one is the doctor making an estimate of the probability that the patient has the disease. And that's based on a lot of things. It's based on, first of all, the cohort that that patient comes from, what is the you know, prevalence for that cohort, and then a lot of other factors. The patient's personal history, the patient's family history, uh, symptomology, uh, examination. The doctor does a lot of things to refine his estimate of the probability. But at some point, he has a number or should have a number. At that point, he may order a diagnostic test. And that test will come back either positive or negative. And then you have the same Bayesian update step. You take the initial estimate of the probability, and you weight the test, the diagnostic test, and you come up with a new estimate of the probability. And the crucial thing here is that you need some idea of the strength of the test. Is this a good test? Does it have discriminating power? OK? Because if it's a weak test, it doesn't help you much. If it's a very strong test, it might. So let's see if we can refine that idea a little bit. On this slide, what I've done on the vertical axis is just indicate the probability that the patient has a disease. That goes from 0 to 100. And I've put in a horizontal dotted line, which I called the treatment threshold, which I've put at around 50%, based on the notion that if we believe a patient has the disease at 
50% or more, we'll proceed to treatment. Otherwise, we won't. And we can see two cases here. Um, for the case where the doctor's initial probability is well below the treatment threshold, okay? On the right-hand side, there is a test that's strong enough, okay? And when we do the Bayesian update, we now get a post-test probability that is above the treatment threshold, and we would proceed to treatment. On the left-hand side, we have a different situation we have the case where even if the test comes back positive, it still doesn't push us over the treatment threshold. So that's a test that's too weak. And that's a test that we shouldn't do. Because in some sense, the result doesn't matter. It doesn't change our course of action. And any questions about that or issues? Sir? Who decides the treatment threshold? Good question. The question was, who decides the treatment threshold? That is the doctor, should be the doctor and the patient in combination, okay? And there's a lot of factors that could influence that. Uh, for, for patients, for example, in a certain age group, you might move that threshold up, okay? Uh, so that's not an absolute number. But it is a number that you ought to know before you order the test. Because if you don't know where this line is, how are you going to judge based on the, the post-test probability whether you should go to treatment or not? Now, there's another case, which is the, the symmetrical case. And that's the case where the pre-test probability is above the treatment threshold. And here, the doctor is ordering the test to confirm his belief, okay? So what's important here is, whether you, is when you get a negative result, okay? And once again, on the right, you have the case where the test is strong enough, a negative result will depress your probability to below the treatment threshold, and now you'll change your course of action. You won't proceed to treatment. The case on the left is, once again, the test that's too weak. So you order the test. Even if the test comes back negative, it doesn't change what you do. Okay? So this covers all the possible cases. So how can we summarize this? Well, it turns out that there are two numbers that completely characterize the test. They're called likelihood ratios, LR, generically. LR plus is the likelihood ratio that is used when the test comes back positive. LR minus is the likelihood ratio that you use when the test comes back negative. And in some sense, they both characterize the length of the arrow. So. The, the better likelihood ratios have a longer arrow. And conceptually, this is actually pretty simple, okay? The likelihood ratio is, in some sense, a multiplier. Um, so, so conceptually, there's nothing really challenging here. But now, we sort of get whacked by something we don't expect. Because it turns out that there's a little bit of algebra you have to do. And the reason for that is that Bayes' theorem works with odds and not probabilities. So what you have to do is this little dance where you start with a probability, you do some algebra, you convert it to odds, and then you apply Bayes' theorem which gives you the post-test odds from the pre-test odds using the likelihood ratio. And then you have to convert back from post-test odds to post-test probability. Because it's a three-step dance, I called it a waltz. Uh, feeble attempt at humor. The, the issue here is that basically people don't think in odds. If you want 
someone who's very conversant in odds, you have to go to the track. And there you'll find somebody who knows that a $2 ticket pays back 8 bucks. Uh, but normally people like to deal in probabilities. So, so that's one, one problem, okay? This, this little bit of algebra turns out to be the Mount Everest of this problem for the average person, believe it or not. And I, and I know it's hard for the people in this room to accept that, but um, when, when, you, when you deal with real people, this is, this is the kind of thing that you run into. Now, it turns out there's actually a second place where you stub your toe. And that has to do with the notion that the likelihood ratios for a test are not always what you find in the literature. In fact, there are two other numbers called the sensitivity and specificity of a test. And very often, when you look up a test in the, in the manuals or the handbooks or whatever, those are the numbers that you find. Well, once again, this is not insurmountable. There's a little bit of algebra that takes you from sensitivity and specificity to the likelihood ratios. And back. I mean, it's a two-way transformation. Yes? Yeah, you know, when you started, you were talking in terms of percentages, which aren't probabilities. And that, right. So, I don't know, do people have a problem with that, too? Because I'm beginning to think this is really down in the weeds here. Well, most people will... The, the question was, I was talking before about percentages, and percentages are not probabilities. Most people can make the leap that 0.5 on the probability scale is 50%. That, that you know, we can get over that. Um, the real problem has to do when you interject odds, because th that just throws people for a loop. And down here, once again, uh, these numbers have different scales. Uh, sensitivity and specificity both range from 0 to 1. It's a, it's a decimal number between 0 and 1. The likelihood ratios are different. LR plus can go from 1 to infinity, because it's a, an odds multiplier. LR minus goes from 0 to 1. So if your likelihood ratios are equal to 1, your test is completely useless. Okay, there's no, there's no multiplier. You can sort of explain almost all of this to people, and they will get it. What they can't do are the transformations, OK? And as I said, this is, this is really and truly annoying, because for us, this is just a mechanical problem, right? So my colleagues and I looked at this, and we said, aha, this is a job for nomograms, OK? Because you could solve this problem completely with, with a, a good nomogram. So now we got to do nomography in a nutshell, OK? Nomography was invented, actually, by a fellow by the name of Ocagne between uh, 1880 and 1900. And a nomogram is nothing more than a slide rule on paper without a slide. OK, that's the way to think about it. It's a custom slide rule. And what the scales do is they take the algebraic relationships and they render them geometrically. It's a beautiful, beautiful idea. Very simple. And because it's geometric, you get a lot of insight through the visualization that the nomogram provides you. And, and I'm going to show you this in a little bit. Uh, as we saw in our simple example, the, the basic idea is you have two scales, you locate points, you draw a straight line, your answer is found on the third scale. Uh, so simple a caveman could do it. Nomograms had a great run in engineering and medicine and a lot of other fields, uh, and they died basically with the slide rule. When the slide rule went down, when pocket calculators came in, they took nomograms down with them. And uh, nomograms were not exactly dead, but uh, ironically, they started to make a comeback in 1990 because people in medicine started to use them again. And so, uh, you know, we're keeping nomograms alive, but it's, uh, it's touch and go. Now, there is one feature here that's kind of interesting. 
Nomograms can be very easy to use and should be very easy to use, but they can be very, very difficult to construct. And we're going to come back to that later. Now, another thing that kind of drops out of the sky. In 1975, just about the end of the golden era of nomograms, a fellow by the name of Dr. Terry Fagan at Baylor College of Medicine sent a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine. And I've actually displayed the entire article here on the left. That's it. That's all he sent them, in which he basically solved that first problem with this simple nomogram. And you've seen this nomogram before, right? It was on the roadmap slide. And what he did was map prior probability, some measure of likelihood ratio, and post-test probability. And it was elegant. It was minimalist. It was just amazing. It became, became known in the, in the field as the Fagan nomogram. Uh, rightly so. Uh, it's been cited hundreds of times over the last 35 years. Unfortunately, once again, down at the clinician level, it's hardly been used at all. Been royally ignored. Uh, and as a result of not being used, it of course hasn't been improved upon. Um, until 2011, when my collaborators and I decided to do something about that. Uh, by the way, Dr. Fagan is still alive, still practicing medicine at a veterans hospital in Pennsylvania. When we got started on this, I contacted him using email, of course. And uh, he's a wonderful guy. Uh, he actually, that guy is so smart, he does the calculations in his head. Okay, he doesn't need nomograms, okay? But the thing that amazes me is that he did this kind of just out of whole cloth, sent it to the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and, you know, kind of nobody noticed, so to speak. Um, but we noticed. So what we decided was one of the reasons that Fagan's nomogram didn't get used was that it was so elegant and so minimalist that it was hard to use. It wasn't user friendly. I mean, the labels on the scales are, are you know, not user friendly. He basically expresses Bayes' theorem in terms of conditional probabilities. What we've learned is the minute you start talking to people about conditional probabilities, boom, you lose them. Okay, so you need something a whole lot more user friendly than this. Which brings us to the new Bayes nomogram, which, uh, well, reserve, reserve judgment. Okay, it, ac it actually, I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that it's more user friendly. The trick here is that we wanted to get as many different representations on one graphic as possible. So the trick to using this is to ignore the scales that you're not currently using. So let me show you basically, forget for a moment the ellipse, the red and blue ellipse on the inside. Just focus on the circle and the scale in the middle. And I'm going to actually pass out a bunch of these so people can, this is the test, OK? Uh, you can, you, we're going to actually try and use this on the fly. And I'm going to show you, even though you've never seen a nomogram like this before, that it's uh, perfectly usable. OK. Any other victims? Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to, I, have a comment, I have a comment about that, Scott. OK, you, you all brought your straight edges, right? OK, if you didn't bring a straight edge, you can use the edge of your iPhone. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Well, maybe you haven't you brought your. For you? OK, so I did bring some straight edges. You uh, can pass these back. Why don't 
you take care of getting these distributed to the right people. Okay, so notice that down here on the bottom, there's something called pretest probability. And on the other side of that scale, we've put the odds. So people who want to go back and forth between probability and odds, that's just a little map there. On the upper half of the circle, there's the post-test probability and odds. Okay? So let's, let's see how this would actually be used. And you, can, you folks can, that have them can play along. Um, let's go back to our test. If you know nothing about the patient at all, you know that the pretest probability is 18%, because 18 people out of 100 are diseased. So find on the bottom 18% on the pretest probability scale. Locate that. Now it turns out that this test has an LR plus of 2.8. And if you come up to the middle here on this axis and find 2.8, okay, you, now you have your two points. So take your straight edge from 18% through 2.8 and go up to the top. And what post-test probability do you get? About 38%, right. So you have your answer. You're done. As fast as you can draw a straight line. Now, there's some other things that you can do with this nomogram. Suppose, for example, someone says to you, OK, we're going to stick with this LR plus of 2.8. We're going to stick with this test. And we're going to assume that 50% is the treatment threshold. By the way, this test is too weak, right? Because it only gets us to 38%. And if our treatment threshold is 50%, we're not there. So we would not use this test for routine screening. It's just not strong enough. But suppose someone said, we are going to use this test, and we, we are going to keep the post-test probability or the treatment threshold at 50%. What does the prior probability need to be for this test to be useful? Well, you can, you can figure that out using your nomogram, right? Because you can put post-test probability at 50%, go through the 2.8 point, and find the point on the prior probability scale that would make that test good enough. And if you do that, what number do you come up with? Pardon? 27. 27, approximately right, 27, 28%. There's another calculation you can do. OK, suppose you stay with the 18% and 50%. What then does the power of the test have to be to be good enough? If you were looking for another test that would be powerful enough. Now you put prior at 18, post-test at 50%. Where does it intersect this axis? Well, we're going to get the answer here very quickly. <coughs> I think it's about four point something. Hmm? Is that what you get? Yeah, three point something. Okay. So the point is, you can do a lot of what ifs when you have the nomogram. And you can do them quickly and with sufficient accuracy to be useful. Now, you could do pretty much that with Fagan's original nomogram. Our improvement is what happens when LR plus is unknown. Well, that's when the inner ellipse comes into play. The inner ellipse has specificity and sensitivity on it. It turns out that this test has a sensitivity of 0.17 and a specificity of 0.94. So you can locate those points on the inner ellipse. And by connecting those points, you discover what the LR plus is. So this is the thing that solves the second half of the algebra problem. This converts sensitivity and specificity to LR plus. 
And then as soon as you have LR plus, it's the same calculation you had before. So instead of solving the entire problem with one straight line, it now takes you two straight lines. Still not anything that's overpowering. So the rest of this is sort of what I would call mopping up a lot of details. Obviously, you can use the nomogram to do the same thing for LR minus. In other words, the thing that we just did was for a, for a positive test result. But you can use the same nomogram if you're going in the opposite direction, if you're doing a test uh, you know, where you want the result to be negative. The nomogram, if you look at it in some detail, has several other scales superimposed on the same graphic that allow you to determine the important parameters in three different ways, actually. You can start with the original two by two matrix and do some calculations that will allow you to use a nomogram to get to LR plus and LR minus. Uh, l let me just say in general that you don't have the two by two matrix. That generally is not what's published. Okay? Generally what's published are either the likelihood ratios or the sensitivity and specificity. And I've showed you how you can use the nomogram if you know either LR plus, LR minus, or sensitivity and specificity. So we basically have enough scales on that nomogram to cover all three cases. As I said, in practice, what you see most of the time when you look up parameters for a test are sensitivity and specificity. Now, it's important to note that the test parameters, whether they're sensitivity or specificity or uh, LR plus and LR minus, are cohort specific. In other words, they depend on data that was gathered from a certain cohort. And if the person that you're going to apply this test to is not typical of that cohort, then all bets are off. Okay, and that's an important thing to remember. Um, the interesting thing about this is that in some way the protocol is actually doubly Bayesian in the following sense. An individual's post-test probability just results from a Bayesian update based on the test parameters. But where do the test parameters come from? The test parameters come from historical data which is constantly being updated as more and more people get tested. And those parameters themselves are updated using a Bayesian update, right? Because you start out with certain parameters, you have various new sub-cohorts that are added, and those tests have various strengths, and you adjust your test parameters by doing basically a Bayesian update. So uh, that's one of the things that gives this thing very, uh, a great deal of strength over time, is that the parameters themselves are undergoing a Bayesian update. For those of you that have the nomogram um, that I passed out, if you turn over on the back, let me just borrow this for a second. I don't have a slide of this. There is a second nomogram on the back, which is designed for rare diseases. And the reason for that is when you have a very low pretest probability, you need a very high LR plus to make the test important, uh, strong enough. In fact, in some cases, you might have to do multiple tests. Okay? The scaling of this nomogram has been adjusted to expand the uh, um, sensitivity, if you will, in the region where you need it the most, which is low pretest probability and very large LR pluses. All of this uh, is described in much more, let me give this back, all of this is described in much more detail uh, in the article uh, where we go into this basically uh, we, take a, we take a sample problem 
and we, we basically go from beginning to end uh, with all the numbers in place. So, remember I said that one of the problems was that nomograms were easy to use or should be easy to use but hard to construct. Uh, back in the early 60s when I was in engineering school this was something that they actually taught engineers. Uh, it was part of our it was actually part of our engineering courses and part of our uh, mechanical drafting courses, if you can believe that. Um, but, you know, we're now in the 21st century, so if we're going to use nomograms, it shouldn't be, you know, the labors of Hercules to create them. Um, so, one of my collaborators, Lee Frochier, the fellow in Helsinki, has written a package in Python, and this is one of the connections to this audience, uh, which is unbelievable, okay? What it allows you to do is write a Python script that describes the relationships implicit in the nomogram, and also, as part of this script, describe all the aspects of the display. Okay, whether the scales are parallel, circles, you name it. That's your input, a Python script, and the output is camera-ready PDF. In fact, the nomograms that you see here were all created with Pynomo. Okay, they were all computer-generated. And this is actually something that, when I first saw it, I didn't believe it. Uh, because for me, it said, this is one of the things that's going to allow nomography to survive because we no longer have to train nomographers. Uh, if someone understands what a nomogram is, they can now write a Python script. Leaf is also working about on getting sort of the same idea to be able to build nomograms that will be uh, displayable on iPads with some interactive capability as well. Uh, because he's basically got the engine over here, the Python engine, to do this. Uh, and that project is, you know, in, in pretty good shape. Uh, we're, we're struggling a little bit with finding people to beta test it. But that's sort of a reflection of the state of nomography, not the state of the Python package. Uh, and this package, in the hands of someone really competent. Ron Durfler can take this package and just generate almost any nomogram you'd, you'd ever be able to conceive of. Uh, so, uh, what I like to call the new nomography is the ability now to generate the artifacts, the hard copy, uh, programmatically. And that's pretty much it. Um, I'll, I'll be glad to take questions. Vince. Okay, this is intensely analog. What about going digital? Why don't you just uh, make it a phone app or something? So the question is, why bother with nomograms? Why not just write a smartphone app? And the answer to that, from my point of view, is goes back to the two-part problem. Yes, the iPhone app would allow you to calculate the answer. You could input sensitivity and specificity and pretest probability, and boom, out would come post-test probability. So you could do graphics too. But the point is, for me, the problem of communicating to the patient. Okay, And what I believe is extremely useful about the hard copy and sitting with the patient with a straight edge and a pencil and drawing the lines is he can actually see what's going on. And you, it's also self-documenting, by the way, okay? Because he can take that home and, you know, look at it after the fact, after he's out of the doctor's office. The doctor can also sign and date it and put it in the patient's file. Um, there's a lot of other places where it's useful. Uh, imagine you're in the third world where you don't have access to the internet or a lot of computing resources, but you still have people who have diseases, okay? 
Nomogram doesn't require any electricity, uh, no batteries, uh, you know. Uh, if you got a straight edge and the nomogram, you're in pretty good shape. So w we think from that point of view, there are certain advantages that tend to be overlooked. And uh, yes, um, there's, a, there's a place for smartphone apps. Um, I just think as a patient, if I'm sitting there and I, and I watch the doctor punch four numbers into the smartphone and he says the answer is X, uh, it's, it's the black box problem, okay? You have to trust that piece of software. Yes? What's the reaction of the doctor's been? Um, it's hard to get them to listen. Um, they, they are very busy. This is, this, first of all, the, just the whole protocol of doing a, you know, it, explaining this as a Bayesian update is tricky. Uh, one of the things uh, is the question that this gentleman asked, you know, who picks the treatment threshold? Uh, but I've had some, some very disturbing interactions. Uh, for example, one practitioner said to me, well, where would I find these numbers that tell me the strength of the test? And I said, oh, you mean you're ordering tests for which you do, don't know the strength? And he said, yeah, but I know they're good tests. I mean, you, 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 you sort of see the, some of the issues that are in play here. Um, and, and that's a big problem because the doctor can't explain it to the patient if the doctor doesn't understand it. And that's, you know, I'm at the point of trying to educate both sides. And I'm finding that um, the, pa the patients, in some sense, are more willing to listen, and, but, but the doctor's just too busy. And, and I think it's going to be a problem getting this way of thinking about things down at the clinician level. Andy. Well, one 2000 solution, year 2000 solution, is a web page that has tests and, specif and specific specificities, possibly by clinic, possibly by lab, possibly by whatever level of stuff, and ignore the doctors. At your own peril, okay? And, and here we run into a different problem, which is if you go out on the web and you start looking for sensitivities and specificities of tests, you will find them. The problem is you'll find too many of them. And once again, it's very dangerous for the man in the street to start looking at this and, you know, not picking the wrong values for the test that's being proposed in his case. So to my way of thinking, the doctor has to be involved. We have prior evidence where patients run ahead of doctors. Yes. We see that actually in pharmaceuticals, where 30 years ago, the pharmaceutical companies pitch the doctors. Now, in all the magazines and TV ads, they pitch the patients, and the patient goes to the doctor and said, says, you know, would drug XYZ be good for me? So you're right about that. Yeah. Um, I, I just am very, very frustrated by the complete lack of any kind of conceptual or mathematical framework that surrounds this whole process. Because understand that as a public health issue, testing is expensive. This is not just prostate or mammograms. This covers everything. And Testing, medical testing, is a multi-billion dollar business. And there are people who are very, very interested in a patient maybe not knowing too much about this, OK? In fact, with third-party payer, you have the situation where the patient is inclined to just order tests because, you know, it's better. The doctor, of course, is on the same page because if he's ever brought into court for malpractice, he can always point and say, look, I, I did the test, you know? So 
So it's a way of him reducing his risk at relatively low cost. But there has, there has been progress. Well, actually, no cost to the doctor. Last fall, last October, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force actually came out with a recommendation that prostate testing no longer be routinely done. And that was because of this kind of math, okay? And it inspired a firestorm of controversy, okay? Uh, it, you wouldn't believe it. And the reason is, every time one of these recommendations come out, there are people who write letters in the popular press saying, early screening saved my life. And it's extremely dramatic, and it's extremely powerful. Okay, I mean, well, no, but I, you know, I'm standing, I'm standing up here saying we we shouldn't do that. Okay, and so that it puts me in the position of being the guy who doesn't want to save lives. Well, you got to understand that saving lives is a good thing, but it's one half of the problem. Okay, think about all the people who were diagnosed false positive, and all the hell that they went through because of that. And, the, you know, remember we said of the eight biopsies, five of them are going to come back negative? Okay? Well, all eight of those biopsies got charged for. Okay? The really interesting, the really interesting thing about this is the head of the American Cancer Society, the chief medical officer, is a fellow by the name of Brawley, Otis Brawley. And he wrote an article after this recommendation because, as I said, it was extremely controversial. And he backed the recommendation, which was, you know, no more routine testing. And at the end of this article, I'm just going to quote the last paragraph of the article. And he says, more than anything, the battle over prostate cancer screening raises a disturbing question. Are we as a society prepared to pay attention to scientific evidence? I'll say it again. More than anything, the battle over prostate cancer screening raises a disturbing question. Are we as a society prepared to pay attention to scientific evidence? The scientific evidence says we shouldn't be doing it. Well, to be fair, the number 50% is value judgment. Absolutely. It is not a scientific number. Absolutely. I couldn't, so, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, the interesting thing about Dr. <coughs> Brawley uh, is Dr. Brawley is African American. And African American men have a higher pretest probability of having prostate cancer because they're in a different cohort. So for them, actually, the screening would make sense because they're not at the 18 percent, they're up at 28 percent or more. So for them the test does make sense, which is why the recommendation that came out was talk to your doctor, find out if you're in a higher risk group, and between you and your doctor make the decision about whether to be tested or not. That was the second part of the don't do uniform screening for everybody. Okay, and you know th this that to me was a sign that we're starting to get to the right place where instead of just doing blanket testing we're applying some science to the problem is one a digital test result to go along with before a test is ordered you know I think that would be a good idea yeah, except, I, except going the other way it's to save some money if well, you use weak tests, then there's less testing, well, so that saves the money. There's a simple calculation. Does this test make sense? Well, the, the, the real answer is that insurance companies are always weighing over the entire population the cost of ultimately treating the disease as well as finding it. And, and so it... it the test isn't worth, worthwhile, then it doesn't change the outcomes of treatment. And, otherwise, your basic assumption is wrong. Well, in fact, in the case of prostate cancer, it's even more complicated than that because 
even after you've identified that someone has prostate cancer, okay, there's, there's two forms, right? There's the aggressive form and the indolent form. So the treatment really depends on what form you have. Unfortunately, there's no test today that allows you to distinguish that, which is, which is a real mess, okay? Because now everyone is treated, everyone that is diagnosed feels he's got to be in the aggressive class and should be treated. And that's just not the case. Term of a wonderful app. You put in a cohort group, you put in this data, and now you know whether the test has some reasonable efficacy that you will treat. And you have a set of assumptions that you can go back against. It seems, go back to your earlier example, a no-brainer. Well, I've achieved my objective. <laughs> but, but you must have discussed this with the insurance company. That's the obvious. Well, I discuss it with insurance companies. I know, I know my cohort in many cases. And my cohort changes over time. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, in the I get Facebook world out. we live, <laughs> it could just say, well, here's the test you should have been taking. And as you tell me your test results, I'm going to update all your cohorts, as I know your age, as I know you're this, as I know you're that. You're, 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 you're preaching to the choir. Obvi well, ob obviously, we should be doing this, okay? The question is, why are we not doing it? Will Watson do this? Is this the underlying? You don't need, that. It, you don't need Watson, okay? This is, this is actually a simple problem. This is what evidence-based medicine was all about. Evidence-based medicine was take all the data we have in a huge database, apply all the computation power we have, and come up with reasonable conclusions. Since 1990, people have been saying this. We've made this much progress. That's one of the reasons I'm here today, okay? I want to get more visibility to this whole issue. Our nomograms are just, in some sense, a teaching tool. They could be used with patients, but they're there to illustrate that the solution to this problem does not involve tensor calculus. It does not involve supercomputers, okay? We have the data and the tools we need to do a better job of addressing this problem, and we're not doing it. Fishing on the web, I'll get too much data. Well, once again, the researchers are cranking out tons of data every day. You go to the journals, there's, there's data galore. What's not happening is what I would call intelligent classification, stratification, all the data mining techniques that, my god, I mean, you guys are computer scientists. You, you, you know that this technology exists, right? I mean, we can data mine anything. But for some reason, this, you know, is not, uh, maybe it's not fashionable. I don't know. Well, if, if a journal publishes their final results, that's like one number, a couple numbers. But what you want to do is compile the original data that are erased, that, like for every single individual. Yeah. And I don't think that data is not a giant there, database with all that original. There, there's actually a fellow that's doing this out in Cleveland, Cleveland Clinic, a fellow by the name of Dr. Michael Catan. Uh, who has done all of these multivariate uh, slice and dices on huge amounts of data. He's one of the leaders in this evidence-based medicine thing. He and I, in fact, have written a paper together called What is a Real Nomogram, um, which, which was published in seminars in oncology, okay? He's a voice in the wilderness. I, I hate to say it. Um, you know, he's a PhD, he's not an MD. Well, there is a solution to this problem. Uh, but the problem is, the problem exists at the intersection of medicine, science, and commerce. Okay? And we should never forget the commerce part. Okay? Um, I, I would love to see us do a better job of this. I, I don't have anything against the medical profession and doctors. I really don't. I think they've done a lot of really great stuff. I just think they could do better if they applied a little more science and mathematics to, to what they do. And uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm going to continue with this because I think that there's, I think there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit here that should be harvested. Program numbers on TV? Yes. A medical episode using this somehow. <laughs> numbers has been canceled. Oh. Ah, more <laughs> proof of my hypothesis. <laughs> so, so you can Sir. revive it as a, under a different category. You mentioned early on the algebra of converting from probabilities to odds and then from odds back to yeah. probabilities. Um, I haven't realized the distinction. Would you mind elaborating what that conversion involved? Oh, it's, it's trivial. Um, if you have a 50% probability of something happening, that's even odds, okay? So one, to two. one to one. One to one. One to one, okay? If you have a 33 and a third percent <coughs> chance of something happening, that's one in three, so the odds are two to one against. If you have a 67% probability, the odds are two to one for, okay? So it's a lot easier. No, it isn't. No, that's exactly my point. It's, 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 it's arithmetic, okay? But people can't do it. You give that problem to most doctors, and they'll throw you out of their office, okay? And they pass you on to another one. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll maybe refer you to a specialist. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but you, know, this, you know, we can laugh about this all we want, but there's two things that are happening, okay? Bad decisions are getting made, which cause people pain and suffering, and in some cases, their lives. And the public health costs here are off the charts. The guy 50 years ago, the guy who discovered PSA, the prostate-specific antigen, the scientist who discovered it, is on record as saying that he regrets it because it has led to what he calls the greatest public health disaster in the history of the country. The guy who discovered the antigen. Public health costs, I sort of hinted before, if you optimize that, does that that if you do it the wrong way, the wrong criteria, if you just for the money, if you wish, can hurt your patient. And if the idea is having fewer tests, then, then you might pick the wrong test from a patient's well, point of view. You know. my, 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 you, my, 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 my point is that there is no way to guarantee you're going to make the right decision. It's a probabilistic no, no, calculation. Okay, but you can put biases in. It's like going for a loaded dice instead of an unloaded dice. Yes, dice. yes, yes. My, my point my is point. that a lot of the questions aren't getting asked because too many people say, well, the insurance company's paying for it. Okay? And, no, no, and, and we understand that when you say that, everybody pays for it, right? And, but what I'm trying to point out is in this age where the costs of public health measures have become so politicized, okay? I mean, because of the health care bill and the you know, incredible backlash that that's created. I think we can no longer ignore these public health costs. They've become huge, huge. And, and the problem with things like universal screening is when you have that kind of program, you just got to multiply by the number of people in the population and you get some big numbers, okay? I don't think we can continue to ignore those numbers. End of rant. PSI. When I finally saw a history of my PSI, PSA. it went, went down, I was happy. Yeah. It was very simple. Well, when I, that's, that's sort of the, in communication, we use base theorem all the time. Here, here, so we here, have enough samples. Here's the, ulti right. here's, here's the ultimate irony. Of those eight guys who had PSA come back greater than four yes. and had biopsies, yes. the five guys whose biopsies came back negative were overjoyed, right? I don't have cancer, okay? And all I can say is, wouldn't it have been better if they didn't even have to have the biopsy? So, I don't know. I, I think there are no simple answers, but I, but I think the problem is amenable to solution. Well, but also, out of, those 50, out of those five guys, make it 50 guys, one of them didn't come back because biopsies aren't, aren't safe. 
Yes. So all of this, all, all of this neglects, all this neglects the cost and side effects yeah. of things like the biopsy. Yeah. yeah. So it, 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 there, nothing is free. Yeah. Some yeah. poor schlub didn't have it and died anyway. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, tell your friends about it. Cool. I think I did okay on time. Yeah, yeah. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.